So um, can everybody see that? That's coming up, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's fine. It's good. All right. So just to begin with, as Kevin said, um, we were going to um, display the cover of the report just to give you a bit of a sense of the area that the Barclay covers. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but it's a, it's a huge area, um, a beautiful part of, of the world, I think, beautiful part of Australia, lovely place to be spending some time in to do some research. Um, so look, just really briefly, this is what we've done. Um, we expanded, so the 2003 report had a focus on Tennant Creek. Um, we've now gone out to eight communities in total, including Tennant Creek, and um, those communities are listed here. So Elliot, Alikarung, and Bladderwich, Opara, Canteen Creek, Epinara, and Alparoralum. Um, what we've done is to consider um, all types of legal problems, so civil, family, and criminal law um, access to justice issues. And we've looked at, um, so I'm just trying to get rid of your, your images so I can see the slides, that's right. Um, we've looked at legal and justice needs in these areas and whether they're being met through current service delivery and related strategies and also through the legal system. Um, we ran some yarning circles with community members, so there were uh, 10 people in each community. And at those circles, we asked people to complete a survey and to engage in some discussion. So we've asked them what type of legal issues they're experiencing. Are they resolving these issues, including with legal help? For criminal law issues, um, we asked specifically, was the outcome that they received fair in their view? If not, why not? And that kind of sparked some conversation about the criminal justice system. And we've sought some comments on how legal and other services are meeting legal and justice needs in their communities, what's working in this regard and how to improve um, that service delivery. And again, comments on how the legal system is responding to legal and justice issues what's working well in these responses and how we might improve them. But we've also stepped outside of that and asked community, um, other than improving service delivery and legal system responses, what else is needed to ensure better justice outcomes? Uh, we've done a number of interviews. Some of those were a revisit um, uh, to those organisations and individuals that contributed to the 2003 report to give us a bit of perspective. And we've done a literature review. We've had a look at the current policy context. Um, an important part of that is the Barclay Regional Deal, which is uh, using a sort of collaborative collective impact approach to try to deal with um, or respond to local policy and related issues. And also just try to get a bit of a lay of the land. And I'll, I'll turn to that in a minute in the next slide, but we're looking at the sorts of issues that are coming up in this part of the world in particular and how they kind of feed into legal needs and access to justice. And then we've made some recommendations about ways to improve access to justice. Um, so this is the uh, lay of the land or the context, socioeconomic context that Kev's um, spoken about in introducing the report. So although the project wasn't initially designed as a, a wholly Indigenous focused project, given that the seven of the eight communities were um, pretty much 100% Indigenous, and the um, large Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population generally in the Barclay, it has become a report that's focused on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander access to justice issues. There's a whole not another piece of work to be done around um, access to justice issues for other culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the Barclay, but we have, we have um, made a decision to focus on um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. And I won't read out those stats again, but you can just see that there's, there's issues to do with levels of formal education, unemployment, um, and so on. And there's also really quite a significant um, reliance on um, Aboriginal langu languages. What we had noticed is that um, in terms of these um, indicators um, around um, unemployment, education, and, and um, income, and so on, not much had changed since 2003. And in some respects, um, things have got a lot worse for communities. The other factor that we were looking at is the remoteness. So as Kev had said, it's it's the really huge land area that we're looking at. It's the largest uh, regional council in the NT, the second largest in Australia. And so what you see is the issues that um, are identified for the Barclay as a whole become uh, a lot more pronounced in remote communities. So whilst unemployment in the Barclay is at about 24.9%, 
In Alcara, it's 72.4, and in Bloodowich, it's around 88.9 compared to 70% in the, in the NT. So the reason these were important issues to look at is because they, they feed into certain types of legal problems and disputes, and they also have access to justice implications. So I've listed a few of them there. Um, but just to give you some examples, if we have lower education levels in a particular part of the world, we're likely to have lower literacy issues. Um, this can um, lead to a lesser understanding of contractual obligations. For example, when people are signing up to mobile phone plans, which then gives rise to credit and debt and consumer issues. So for our participants, around 31% of them identified having a credit and debt related issue. Um, higher unemployment means there's a higher dependency on social security. So around 88% of our participants were relying on benefits. And this gives rise to social security related issues. So we had about 34% of participants experiencing problems in these areas, in this area. And it also, also a, a higher reliance on legal aid, legal aid or you know, government subsidized service delivery. So it puts a lot of pressure on the legal services locally. In terms of remoteness, which we'll talk about again, um, there's, this has impacts because there are there is limited access geographically to legal help and other services and programs that have access to justice implications. So one thing that came up was lack of diversion for young people um, out on remote communities. And then if we talk about um, high use of Aboriginal language, this gives rise to language and cultural barriers when you're interacting with um, mainstream criminal justice system. People are not understanding the process and outcome processes and outcomes in that system including because interpreters are not used as much as they should be. And there we, therefore we have um, a, a certain degree of, of breaches of orders. So people cycle back into the system. So that just gives you some idea about why it was important to look at that context um, for the person. Yeah, Sorry. and I just, yeah, before we go into the other slides, just add one more point that, yeah. um, I mean, Kev mentioned at the beginning and you've mentioned, Fiona, the size of, of the Barclay mm -hmm. and you know, the population is around, say, 7,000 people. Um, and and Fiona's already mentioned that the need to think outside the box in terms of the recommendations. I mean, if we think about a si the size of a place, which is one and a half to two times the size of Victoria, with 7,000 people, then the kind of dominant models of service delivery simply, you know, don't work and aren't going to work unless you think outside the box in terms of the ad addressing those issues that um, Fiona's raised in this slide. Yeah. Yeah, the remoteness was, um, and the size was just, yeah. And, and I think the thing is that um, the value of this report, as Kev has suggested, is it's not that these issues are exclusive to um, the Barclay. I think the issues that are coming up around remoteness and, and remote Indigenous communities in particular are things that a lot of parts of Australia um, need to look at. So we're hoping that some of the value of this report will be, um, you know, potentially informing um, reforms or, or thinking about different ways of doing things outside of the Barclay as well. But it was very pronounced in the Barclay. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the problems that we were um, uncovering. Uh, we That is all in the report. There's a lot of detail. People have shared a lot about the sorts of experiences that they're having in terms of legal problems. But just really briefly, um, I'll just point out that, um, as you can see, we've got really pronounced levels of need in, in communities. So um, over two thirds of people were experiencing housing relating issues. And I'll talk about them um, in a second. We had under, I think it was about 8.6% or so of people had, had um, completed a will, but um, nearly half wanted some legal assistance to complete a will. They were reporting issues like um, disputes about burials and estates after someone had passed away. Discrimination was a huge one as well, particularly for men. Um, so around 40% of people experienced race discrimination and that was predominantly or often in the um, criminal justice system. And so look, I, I encourage you to go into the report. Um, importantly too, we've got around one in five people experiencing a criminal law issue. That's just, um, you know, an indicator, I guess, of the disproportionate representation of um, First Nations people in the justice system. And so we've also split this by gender. Again, if you're interested, um, have a look at the report. Housing was still a main issue for men and women, but there were some differences. So discrimination was um, 
you know, close to two thirds of men were reporting experiences of race discrimination predominantly. And again, they were often um, within the criminal justice system. So you can see uh, for the female participants, um, crime, criminal justice issues didn't really figure in the more prominent issues, but they are sitting there for, um, in the main issues that men were experiencing. Um, so look, I won't spend too much time on that. I just wanted to really get into what we thought we could do about trying to meet these high levels um, of need and address uh, justice related issues in the Barclay. If we think about access to justice generally, it's usually it's defined as involving legal processes and outcomes. And it's about an individual seeking or attempting to resolve a legal dispute or problem within legal frameworks. So we're talking about courts and tribunals, legislation, and legal assistance and so on. So these are really important components of access to justice. And we've thought um, you know, in a lot of detail about how, how we can make sure all those moving parts of the legal system are working really well. But we've also um, looked at access to justice more broadly because legal responses cannot be the only, the only solution to the problems that we're um, dealing with and that we've talked about in the report. However, we've also noted that legal services have a key part to play in all of these different aspects of justice, of access to justice. So as Kev said at the beginning, we've been thinking about how to prevent legal problems or disputes from arising in the first place, for example, through community legal education, thinking more strategically. So it's not just dependent on an individual to stand up and assert their rights, which is quite difficult to do um, when you can't identify that you have a legal issue, particularly around civil and family law issues. Um, or when you're um, in a more marginalised group. So thinking about things like strategic litigation, policy reform, and early prevention and intervention, um, and I'll talk about justice reinvestment um, towards the end of the slides. Thinking about, as Janet suggested, um, more collaborative approaches to reducing or resolving legal and justice issues. So really we're thinking about government, non-government, legal and non-legal um, organisations all playing a part in resolving these issues and, re and reducing them. And most importantly, I guess, or, or very importantly anyway, is empowering communities and the role that they can play. So that's really coming from a community development perspective. Um, I'll just, if we look at just housing um, as an example, um, we'd ask people if they'd been able to resolve um, housing related issues, which generally related to repairs and maintenance, overcrowding and debt. Um, as the stats say here, about 16 out of 57 persons who responded to the question had resolved the issue, but sometimes this was just about paying a debt and accepting the problem rather than challenging it. As an indication of the poor access to legal services, one in 57 persons had accessed legal help. Um, most had gone straight to the department, so gone straight to public housing and, and, and the Shire Council and one out of 57 had actually raised it with a local remote public housing reference group, which um, are bodies set up in remote communities that are intended to gather information about local housing related issues and feed that back into um, up, up, up to government to try to resolve the issues. The sorts of reasons they were giving for why they hadn't resolved issues is that they didn't understand why they had a debt and therefore how to address it. Uh, they didn't know who to speak to, they didn't know how to get onto the waiting list for housing and so on. So a lot of issues to do with really not knowing what to do. Um, that they are raising issues but no one's listening and that there's broader policy concerns so there are simply no houses available and that then leads to overcrowding and issues to do with repairs and maintenance and so on. So just taking this as an example, um, we have stressed in the report the, this, the essential nature of um, the, the essential importance, I guess, of being able to access legal assistance. So there are examples given where people had accessed legal help and they had got a better outcome, such as a reduced debt. And we've got a really good example of the class action that's going on in Santa Teresa, where um, there's, a, there's a collective class action going on to try to, uh, that's, that's been challenging government about the state of housing. So legal assistance um, is really important. It's, it's a, a human right to be able to access uh, legal assistance as part of access to justice. But we've sort of stepped back and said, yes, but we need to be thinking about policy responses by government. So government needs to step in and deal with things that are more systemic 
level, for example, to address overcrowding and repairs and maintenance issues, we need to build more and better quality culturally appropriate housing. There's some real concerns about the way the department is interacting with Aboriginal tenants. So um, there's some substantial levels of debt on community and people were sort of saying they just got issued with these debt notices without really understanding exactly how it had arisen or how to challenge it. That's something that could be um, the responsibility of department to explain things better and to make sure people know how to respond um, by accessing legal help, for instance. We're also Fiona, sorry, I was just going to jump in and say, I mean, I mean, most people in the Territory will be aware of it anyway, but I mean, the level of debt is just astounding when you've got people of tens of thousands, debts of tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And part of that seems to have been arising because of the way um, rents have been collected by the department. Um, so things have just accumulated. Um, Non-legal services also having a role to play. So um, we spoke to some health clinics that were really aware of the link between health and justice outcomes. Um, and we're trying to do something to change it for individual um, patients or clients and the community. So they gave us an example of a, a man that had a pretty bad gastro issue. He was airlifted or taken out of the community to get some legal help. Um, but that his, um, his bathroom facilities, like his toilet and everything were in such a terrible state of repair. He gets taken off the community to address the health issue, but then he gets put back into, the ha into his home with exactly the same conditions. So they're just trying to advocate for change to try to break that cycle. And we've also got financial counsellors, for example, being able to support tenants with debt. Um, and the last point is just, you know, um, thinking about properly empowering those um, community-based groups that may be able to be a voice for community to try to address these issues. So you can just kind of see how legal issues are an important part of it. And in fact, legal services probably have a part to play in each of those different aspects of access to justice, but it can't be just about, um, you know, reacting to legal problems as they arise um, from a legal perspective. Um, so, look, I'll just go through quickly some of the recommendations that we've made. Um, because there were issues around people not having a lot of awareness about, what their, about their rights and responsibilities, and this was particularly the case for civil and family law issues, um, and because there was, um, people were reporting not really being able to understand what was going on in the criminal justice system, um, we have made some recommendations around um, more community legal education. Um, and we had made some recommendations based on what people were saying about um, what good practice looks like in that space. So, for example, making sure that you're actually covering areas that community are identifying as important and delivering it in quite innovative and effective ways, um, such as through radio. When we were out at Alpurulam, I think it was Karma that was out there, they were talking to community about community running some radio programs themselves. And that would be a great opportunity to try to get um, some information out there about legal rights um, that would be in a program that's sort of led by community and embedded in community. Um, we've also suggested that government also needs to make sure that community members have the basic information they require to be interacting effectively um, with government agencies. So a lot of the legal problems that are coming up are related to or arise within those interactions. So social security, housing, child protection and so on. Um, and that might include giving people um, more information about who they go to to challenge uh, decisions of government. And we've suggested creating some designated positions within the criminal justice system to improve understanding as well. Um, in terms of, um, there was a lot of discussion of complexity of need uh, of, of uh, community members. They have a lot going on, both legal and non-legal. And part of the complexity um, that you're dealing with in the Barclay is this, you know, the, the very large Aboriginal population and use of um, Aboriginal languages. And also uh, their multiple past and present negative interactions with justice and legal systems to date, which creates a whole lot of barriers. So one thing that um, I know Legal Aid is already doing really uh, successfully is um, recruiting social workers to work alongside lawyers. We've made a recommendation that a social worker um, or social workers could be employed in the Barclay to work alongside legal services to try to meet that complexity of need um, that arises when people present with legal issues. There's often a whole lot of other issues that could be responded to that would help to reduce the incidence of legal problems. 
Um, we've also suggested promoting more Aboriginal liaison positions across legal services, um, and I'll talk about that in a remote context in a minute. Um, but to ensure cultural safety and connection, there's already some really good examples of that um, with, within the legal services that are working really well. So we've just um, advocated for increasing those positions. The issue of interpreters was a big one. Um, are just not being used by legal and other services and agencies. So we're not just talking about um, lawyers and um, those in the criminal justice system. We're talking about all of these government agencies that we've been discussing, um, like housing, um, social security and so on, and making sure people actually understand what's going on in their interactions and what their rights and responsibilities are. The other thing that um, was raised though is that community are not always keen to use interpreters. They're worried about lack of confidentiality and that more interpreters are needed. So getting out into community and educating um, or passing information on about community, about interpreters' roles and responsibilities was also a suggestion we made. Um, thinking about collaboration. Um, we just it's just literally going to be impossible for legal services particularly as they're currently funded to meet the very high level of need um, and also they don't they don't always cover each and every legal issue that arises for people on community they have their areas of expertise um, so we were just trying to think through how the best use how we can kind of make best use of the resources that are at hand and sometimes there are there are quite a few resources out there, but it's really about using them in a smart way and thinking um, collaboratively and also building partnerships and alliances with non legal services. So we have had a focus on um, collaborative and strategic service delivery. Um, so one thing we made some recommendations around is setting up what we call justice partnerships. Now, health justice partnerships is one part of that. And there's already, again, some really good work going on in the territory around this um, and elsewhere. So this is basically where you're uh, um, creating partnerships between legal and justice, um, sorry, legal organisations and health organisations as a way to um, provide a, a gateway for, so people presenting with a health issue are then referred off to or able to connect up with um, legal services. And so it's, it's a really effective way of improving access to justice. Um, and we have made some recommendations about setting them up in remote communities in particular, because the clinics are out there already. Um, as part of this, um, some of the health justice partnerships are using like a legal health check, which is a tool that those without a legal background can use to identify and refer legal issues. And so, um, so for example, a social worker or someone in a refuge or someone in a health service can work with um, people who present to do a legal health check and check whether there's legal issues they need assistance with and link them up with um, legal assistance. With the NT um, Legal Aid Helpline potentially assisting um, those workers to triage the issues that they're identifying. Um, other recommendations about coming together, we've made some um, suggestions about regular network meetings to discuss more strategic issues that need attention. That could be about um, service delivery, but it could be about starting to think through um, areas that policy reform um, could be um, most useful. Setting up MOUs to formalise agreed ways of working. So how are we going to refer people across services, for example? Um, shared calendars so that we can understand which service is travelling to what community when. And potentially sharing resources. We talked about the social worker um, uh, position, but there's also a lot of non-legal um, service and program gaps. So, for example, there was discussion of a lack of therapeutic support for perpetrators of DV or family violence, um, lack of mental health supports and so on. So maybe it's about, you know, coming together as a region or a community and thinking about where these gaps are and, um, and how resources can be set up that could be shared across services. Um, and I've just got a few more slides. Um, one was about servicing remote communities. So again, we, we've been thinking about this from collaborative and community development approaches. So sharing resources across legal services, potentially setting up an Aboriginal legal, a liaison officer position based in Tennant Creek that would travel um, out bush with the lawyers. So that would be shared across the legal services, sharing visits to communities um, by legal and non-legal services 
what we've done is kind of tried to track what services are going out where at the moment and thinking about how services can piggyback uh, on each other's visits as a way to sort of share resources. Um, video conferencing was also discussed as a way to reach out, um, reach services out to remote communities. So that could be for CLE. Uh, it could also assist with court appearances. There's a lot of issues with community members not being able to um, present to court and whether there's capacity to um, use video conferencing for that to a greater degree was something that we discussed. Uh, we've also suggested um, setting up Aboriginal community liaison roles where people are actually living, people living on community take on the role of helping community to identify and respond to legal issues. They would present as a point of liaison for community with legal and other services outside of the community. And we have thought about um, basing that position and possibly also having them employed by council. So just thinking smartly about what's already out on community and how do we kind of um, set up these partnerships or linkages with those that already have a permanent presence out there with legal clinics also, or sorry, health clinics also um, potentially useful in that regard. And we talked with a few of the remote clinics about setting up health justice partnerships um, out in remote communities. And there was a fair bit of interest in that. There was a quite a high level of understanding of the link between health and justice issues um, and, an, and an interest in being as progressive and, and effective as they can be. Um, and look, I might just, um, the other thing is sort of upskilling or resourcing mm. council staff to better triage issues that are coming up um, in community as well. So I might just skip that last one. Um, then we looked at the thing, as I said, we were kind of thinking about things more strategically or systemically. So these issues, you see the same issues coming up across whole communities and across the whole Barclay. So this could be about the way policies are set up. Um, it could be the way governments practices are working and it could be sort of underlying drivers of offending. As an example, these issues are kind of feeding, feeding legal issues and causing problems in relation to access to justice. So how do we address this as a, at a systems level? So we talked before about strategic litigation or policy reform. Um, one thing that the Barclay does have as a strength um, is the Barclay Regional Deal. So you've already got structures set up with three, the three tiers of government um, and various other organisations, um, part of the collective that are trying to deal with things at a more systemic level. So we've made some suggestions about the lawyers feeding legal services and others feeding these access to justice issues into that um, structure to try to address things more systemically, whether that's about um, changing things within the criminal justice system um, or dealing with things like housing and other issues. Um, and uh, the other thing is sort of setting up MOUs with some of these government organisations that will set out really clearly um, best ways to respond to things like breaches of bail. There's some issues at the moment about responses being quite punitive. So it's about trying to resolve those issues at a more systemic level. And this is the last section I just really want to briefly talk about. Uh, it's a really, really important part of the puzzle. And that is um, community leadership and strengthening. So there was some discussion about, you know, setting up more programs and ensuring programs are actually developed and implemented by Aboriginal people themselves and a community embedded and community strengthening strategies more broadly. So the comment that I've included here was someone um, actually out at Elliot who was just saying, um, you know, yes, there's, there's a lot of gaps in terms of what services are out in community. There's a lot of issues out in community, but it, we really need to think about how we're going to address those issues in community. We can't rely on things external to community to solve the problems. People want to be in these communities. Um, they're not going anywhere. So we, we need to think really seriously about how we kind of embed solutions within community. Some of the uh, initiatives discussed was upskilling community members as financial counsellors, which is something that's happening um, in far north Queensland. So community members actually are able to um, provide some um, upskilling in community around financial literacy and point people in the right direction for say credit and debt related issues. Um, strengthening community collectives and decision making. So we talked before about the housing reference group as an example, but what Chris and I did see out on community were these local authority groups, which are really set up um, 
to around council business they've got community members sitting there who are sort of helping to make decisions and there's a lot of positives about them but they just don't really um, they're not elected community members and they don't really have um, power as community members that they might have to kind of take up these issues that are impacting on community rather than responding to council business um, there was discussion of community-led mediation because there's um, intra-community conflict in some of the communities. So that could potentially be about training up um, community members to mediate in those situations to prevent things escalating to criminal issues. And then the last two things I wanted to just briefly discuss, one was justice reinvestment. There's been some discussion about um, getting justice reinvestment happening in the Barclay. Uh, this is a framework whereby you're pulling money out of correctional budgets and putting it back into community led um, decision making and solutions to try to reduce incarceration and offending. It has a really strong focus on prevention and self determination. It could be that the work of the Barclay regional deal is going to kind of tick some of the boxes of justice reinvestment anyway, but um, we're aware that there have been some discussions in the community about actually implementing a specific justice reinvestment program. So I just put those two quotes in there because they indicate that there, there was a fair bit of discussion about the criminal justice system really not providing the answers and actually making things worse for community. And the second quote is um, from a community member in Elliot just saying, look, we do have issues with DV and family violence here, um, but we need to kind of look underneath them and see what are the issues that are driving them. So it could be that we need to think about economic development and employment as ways to address these issues. And the last point was just around night patrol. There was some discussion about that as being a really effective mechanism, but at this point, the Shire has taken um, over control of it. So the potential that it has to be a community led initiative um, has really been reduced. So people were kind of calling for that power and control to be reinstated. And I'll just finish with this really, this last um, quote. We can provide these slides to people if, if need be, but these are all parts of the report that we've just pulled out. So what this person was saying, it was actually someone working in a health clinic, is that um, it's really important to have um, voices and community come together as a collective voice um, to try to address these problems. But um, also important is what can be provided from outside of community to support what it is that community wants. And I think that's just really a fitting way to end because we're talking about um, community empowerment, but also really recognising the importance of um, legal and other services and reforming government systems and so on as a way to kind of support community and what needs to be done to address these issues. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I'm just going to 